Open in your Bibles this morning to Psalm 119. Of course, we are coming to the end of Psalm 119, this sermon series about God's Word, specifically about delighting in God's Word. And I'd like to start off this morning just by uh, praying together uh, before we dive in. God, you are so good. Uh, It has been wonderful uh, to be here this morning, to be with God's people, singing with God's people, singing your praises. And now we come to your holy word. Uh, What a privilege. Uh, What a humbling opportunity to open your word this morning. I pray that you would guide us. I pray that you would focus us. And I pray that you would allow your word to have its work in us this morning. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I heard a a story once about a a young couple, probably a month after their wedding. Uh, They were out on a date, and on their way home, the husband was driving and the wife was in the passenger seat, and the husband had his left arm on the steering wheel and his right arm leaning on the center console, and the wife, of course, because they were so in love, was wrapped around her husband's arm and leaning on his shoulder and uh, just had a great night together. And so the, the wife leans over and looks up at her husband and just says, Honey, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that we're so close. I just love you so much. 20 years later, the same couple, after going out to eat on a date, On their drive home, the wife sits up from leaning on her side of the door and looks over to her husband and just asks him, have we lost our spark? Do you remember when we always used to be so close and so snuggly and so lovey-dovey? Don't you miss that? And then, of course, the husband with his left arm on the steering wheel and his right arm on the console turns to his wife and says, Well, honey, I haven't moved. (laughs) I haven't moved at all. A little bit of a silly illustration there, but... Oftentimes, as Christians, we want to be close to God, don't we? We want to be close to God. The sermon title this morning is The Nearness of God. And the big idea that I want to kind of get across this morning for you is that your best life will be found in close communion with God. Your best life will be found in close communion with God. We we want to be close to God, right? If we're breathing Christians... If we have been saved by his grace, that that should be something that we desire. If it's not, then we've got some serious questions to ask about ourselves. But I think as as a general consensus, Christians want to be close to God. But we want to feel that connection with him. So the question is, how do we pursue intimacy with God? Specifically, how do we know that God is near or how do we feel his presence when we're in the midst of the storms of life? Or you maybe have been there before when everything is difficult, when we feel like, where are you, God? In those moments, we so desperately want his presence. We want to know that he is there. This morning, I I want to argue that you can be close to God even in the midst of those bleakest of circumstances. Remember the psalmist, as we've gone through Psalm 119, here are just a few phrases that describe what's going on in his life. The princes plot against him. The insolent deride him. The cords of the wicked ensnare him. 
They seek to destroy him. He was persecuted, severely afflicted, oppressed, facing anguish, and in much trouble. Just to name a few. And so his life is anything but a walk in the park. I mean, he, he's going through life just like you and I do. He's experiencing hardship just like you and I do. He knows what it means to be brought low. He knows what it's like to be in the midst of, storm, of a storm. Just feeling the weight of the world around him. You can be close to God even in the bleakest of circumstances, you can also be close to God even if you don't feel close to God. You can still enjoy the comfort of His presence even if you don't feel it yourself. A few more phrases that the psalmist uses throughout Psalm 119. He said things like, They have almost made an end of me on this earth. I almost perished in my affliction. And even in our text that we're going to look at this morning, you sense a desperate cry to the Lord for help. Have you ever felt like you're at the end of your rope? In many ways, the, the psalmist is kind of in that type of a situation. Okay, at the, end, the good thing for Christians is that at the end of the rope is God. Christ is there for us at the end of the rope. We don't have to be the ones to hang on to it. And so in the face of these bleak circumstances, in the face of maybe God not even feeling close to the psalmist, how does he not despair? What keeps him from perishing in his affliction? Well, the first half of that verse says, If your law had not been my delight then I would have perished in my affliction. Psalm 119, verses 150 and 151 give somewhat of a summary of these two sections we're looking at this morning. It says, They draw near those who persecute me with evil purpose. They're coming in. They're near. They're close to Him. He says, These people are far from your law, but you are near, O Lord. And all your commandments are true. It is possible to be confident and comforted by the closeness of God. Your best life will be when God is near, when you are in close communion with him. And so just like in our opening illustration of the husband and wife and the husband who always has his hand on the steering wheel and his arm on the console, our God never moves. But we do. And so how can we be sure to live close to God? Or maybe more directly, how does the psalmist here pursue his closeness with God. First idea this morning in our sermon is living close to God. In other words, how do we how do we lean into him? The first thing that we see from the psalmist in verses 145 through uh, 147 or 148 is that he lives close to God by talking to God. He lives close to God by talking to God. I think it probably goes without saying that this psalm, Psalm 119, is filled of verses where the psalmist is talking to God. Right? He's, he's crying out to Him. So what do we notice about these cries in verses 145, 146, and 147? First of all, verse 145, He cries with my whole heart, it says, in verse 145. Spurgeon says, heart cries are the essence of prayer. That's what we're doing when we pray. We, we, we're crying out to God. We're sharing our heart with Him. What does this mean? Well, minimally, I think this means that our prayers should be meaningful and thoughtful. When we pray, we should be aware of the fact that we're talking to God, the Creator of the universe. 
We're talking to the one who sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. You know, I, I would confess that many times when I'm praying, whether it's before a meal or sometimes even to my shame with my kids before I go to bed, I'm just saying words. And the thought, the thought sometimes is not connecting that what I'm doing here is, is literally talking to the God who created me. Praying with your whole heart is not to say that every prayer needs to be a, a prayer of desperation like we see from the psalmist here where, where he's just feeling the weight of the world. He's got these people persecuting. They're near to him. They're upon him. He's, he's crying out for desperate help. But it does mean at the very least that we should be praying with our hearts, with, with the deepest part of our being, that, that we should be aware of what we're doing when we pray. So he cries out to him in verse 145. With my whole heart I cry. 146, I call to you. 147, I rise before the dawn and I cry out for help. Just like David mentioned during our worship service this morning, he should be the place we run to first. He should be our go-to in every circumstance. That's where the psalmist goes. He cries with his whole heart. He does it consistently and persistently. Even before the sun comes up, he's crying for help. Verse 147, I rise before the dawn and I cry out for help. Not only did he cry out for help frequently, but it's almost here as if for him to be awake and conscious meant for him to be depending on God. For him to be awake meant, meant another day where he needs, he literally needs God to intervene in his life and in his heart. Waking up before the sun. We know as people, who, or at least if you've grown up in Christianity, if you've grown up in the church, we, we hear time and time again how important it is for us to be praying. Right? And every time we hear a sermon on prayer, we get all convicted that, oh man, I need to be praying more. I need to be praying this specific way or that specific way. And it's true that, that God's word would highlight the importance of prayer. Right? 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Have a constant line of communication open with the Lord. So it's not just a, a section of our day that we set aside to talk to God, but rather it's a relationship that we enjoy throughout the day. We're constantly going back to Him. Romans 12, 12 says, Be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, and be faithful in prayer. Ephesians six eighteen says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. Colossians 4 says, Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and be thankful. Talking with God should be a natural part of our relationship with Him. Right? That's, that's true in any other human relationship that we have. If you are close to somebody, that means you probably talk to them quite a bit. You speak with them. Prayer orients our hearts towards the Lord. It shows us and reminds us of our dependence on Him. And in that way, it keeps us close to Him. And so not just in this text alone, but in the psalm as a whole, we see the psalmist constantly talking to the Lord. That's how you can lean into him. That's how you can pursue closeness with him. But the other thing that he does here in these first couple verses is he not only talks to God, but he also listens to God. He also listens to God. In other words, he reads and obeys the word of God. He listens when God speaks. Look at how he couples all of the first couple verses here. Psalm 145, with my whole heart, I cry out to you, O Lord, and I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I rise before the dawn and cry for help, I hope, in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night, so that I might meditate on your promise. You see, as much as he's talking to God, he also makes sure that he's listening just as much, if not more. 
We have to listen to God. Talking to God and listening to God, praying and reading are twin pillars that draw our eyes and hearts towards the Lord. They get us looking and keep us looking at Him and Him alone. And so that's, that's kind of the, the foundation that the psalmist is leaning on here when he gets to verse 150 and we're reminded of what's going on in his life when he says, They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. And so he, he's feeling the weight. He's feeling the, the dark clouds. He's, he's feeling that desperation for the Lord. His circumstances are tough. Perhaps he might be even fighting to feel that presence of the Lord. But what does he say? When, when the persecutors come near, verse 151, you are near, O Lord. I know all your commandments are true. As near as the attackers might be, as close as Satan might be with his temptations, the Lord is nearer still. Not only does he talk to God and listen to God, but here we find him trusting God. Here, the psalmist is more concerned with what is true, what is reality, as opposed to what he's feeling or how desperate his circumstances is. How is this possible? Well, he has this foundation. He's built up this purpose to talk to God and listen to God and therefore it allows him to trust God. The psalmist because of his closeness with God, his relationship with God, his constant running to God and running to his word and submitting to his word knows that truth is true all the time. And that ultimately what is true about God and what is true about him is true regardless of his circumstances or his feelings. We see this has clearly been a, a pattern of the psalmist throughout his life. In verse 152, it says, Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. This is, this is nothing new for him. You see, it's, it's not as if all the persecution started coming and all the hardships started coming, and then he decided, oh, yeah, I, sh I should probably run to God. He's my last resort. He had always been the first place that he runs, his constant go-to, regardless of where the roller coaster of life was taking him, God was his go-to. He was constantly talking to God, listening to God, and trusting God. Now, obviously, we're not going to do that perfectly, but that's, that's the pursuit. Living close to God, how do we lean into him? Well, the psalmist talked to God, he listened to God, and that allowed him to trust in God. We see the opposite explanation of living close to God in our second thought that I want to focus here on a little bit this morning, and that is living far from God. So if these things help us to lean into God, what, what are the things that start us inching away from him, if you will? But well, we have an explanation of those who are far from God in multiple of these verses. Let me just read a couple of them here. Starting in verse 150, he's describing these people who are persecuting him with an evil purpose. And what does he say about them? What is true about those who are wicked and far from God? In verse 150, they are far from your law. In verse 155, the next section he says, salvation is far from the wicked. Why? For they do not seek your statutes. Verse 158, I look at the faithfulness with disgust. Why? Because they do not keep your commands. Talking to God and listening to God through his word allows us to, to approach God, to come, come close to God, to be reminded of who he is. The opposite is also true. If we're not talking to him, if we're not, if we don't hold his word up high, if we neglect God's word, that's always going to lead us away from him. Our natural inclination, if you will, our fleshly inclination is to follow ourselves, 
or to follow a temptation or to follow a sin or to follow whatever. You, you can fill in the blank with anything. Anything that we're following first and foremost above our God is, is leading us away from him. And so neglect of God's word always leads to sin. And sin leads you away from God. Sin hinders that relationship with him. Not because, once again, not because he has moved. Not because he sees you sin and says, Oh, wow, what a loser. I don't love him anymore. No, it's because we have chosen sin over God. We have come over here. We've, we've had a party with our sin. We're enjoying it. We're soaking it in. And we've left God where he is sitting. Not only does God not move away from us, he continues to move towards us. And we'll look at that here in just a second. But neglect of God's word always leads to sin, and sin will always lead you away from God. This is true no matter your circumstances. This is true no matter how you feel. You know, one of the saddest things for me to see or to hear is when I talk to people who have told me while living in blatant sin, They'll say things like, well, I know God's word says this isn't exactly the way to go about it, but it just feels like this is the right thing for me to do. I don't feel like God would actually have that big of a problem with what I'm doing if he loves me after all. You are blinded by your sin. Sin makes you stupid. If you're a kid and don't use that word in your household, I apologize in advance to all the parents. But in this case, it's necessary. Sin blinds you from what is true. It distorts reality. Truth is true no matter how you feel. You will not be close to God without also talking to Him and listening to Him and submitting to Him. Let me illustrate it this way. What what if I were to communicate with my wife really well? Is she in here right now? Is she in there? Okay, perfect. She's gone. Let's, pre- let's pretend for a moment that I was great at communicating with my wife. Since I'm a guy, you know that's not true. All right, guys tend to struggle a little bit with the communication. But I, let, me, let me rephrase that. What if I was really great at communicating to my wife? So listen, listen to this. What if, just, just for example, I was never hesitant to tell her anything and everything? Right? I was completely transparent all the time. I told her how I was feeling. I told her what I was wishing for, all my hopes and dreams. I was just constantly talking to her so that I was hiding nothing. She knew me. Like, like that, that was my goal, right? constantly talking to her. But then the second she started responding to me, I'd say, talk to the hand and walk away. Because, really, my concern is that she knows me, but I didn't really care that much about knowing her. This is what we would call a one-way conversation. And as good as I might feel, being able to have a constant source of getting things off my chest, that is not really super conducive for a healthy, deep, and close relationship. Right? Just because I'm talking to her all the time doesn't necessarily mean that I have a good relationship with her because I I don't know anything about her. She has no way of redirecting my errant thoughts. She has no way to lovingly tell me to get over myself. She has no way to assist me to think clearly about what's going on, to help me process through things. And furthermore, or maybe perhaps even foremost, I would be missing now on the great opportunity to know and love my wonderful wife. What a tragedy that would be. And yet I hear people somewhat often 
say, you know, I haven't really been reading my Bible all that much, but it's okay because I pray a lot. You know, my prayer life is real strong. It's okay that I don't read my Bible. I, I mean, sure, it probably would be better if I did, but like, at least I'm praying. And I don't really know what our motivation is for, for, for that. I know it's just our way of justifying ourselves, but is that really okay? How long is that sustainable before it becomes an extremely dangerous place to be living? What then is the primary influence of your prayers? Are they informed by God and His will? Are they in line with His word? Are you really having a relationship with God if all you do is talk but never listen? We need the Word. This is the primary way by which God speaks to His people. This is our spiritual food that gives us the nourishment that we need. This is the mirror that gives us conviction and reveals our shortcomings. This is the light and lamp that gives us direction. This is the primary means by which God, through His Spirit, works to transform us and teach us and to warn us of wrongdoing, to correct our actions and to train us in righteousness and equip us and complete us. We need to listen. We need to pursue His Word. Those who are close to God talk to Him and listen to Him and therefore are able to trust Him And those who are far from God are often neglecting and forgetting his word, which leads them to live in sin, and sin ultimately leads to death. So we've talked about living close to God or leaning into him. We've also compared that to living far from God or inching or perhaps sometimes even running in the opposite direction The third thing I want to talk about this morning is the closeness to God that gives abundant life. This closeness to God that gives abundant life. Let me just read this next little section here. It says, look at my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are those who persecute me and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. So there we have more of the same. We have, right, more talking to God and more listening to God, more upholding his word, extolling the word, lifting it up, praising it for his truthfulness and righteousness. But the other theme that I really see just piercing or, or piercing through these two sections really all together is this cry that the psalmist gives for life. He cries, deliver me. Redeem me. In verse 149, he says, Hear me according to your steadfast love, according to your justice, give me life. In verse 154, Plead my cause and redeem me, give me life according to your promise. In 156, he says, Great is your mercy, O Lord, give me life. In verse 159, Consider how I love your precepts, give me life according to your steadfast love. How? can we have sweet life, abundant life? How can we have communion with God when we drift so easily, when we fail so frequently, when we sin so quickly, and when the the weight of the world is so heavy? Well, it's not because I'm a really good Christian and I'm just super devoted to having my devotions every day. That's not how. It's because, as he says in verse 156, it's because great is your mercy, O Lord. It's because of in 159 when he says, give me life according to your steadfast love. It's not according to me. It's not according to my ability. It's not according to anything that I can bring to the table, really, aside from 
just my, my feebish a- attempts. But it's because of his mercy, it's because of his love, it's because of his grace that he will give life. He's asking for God's grace. He's recognizing God's mercy. And he's looking to God's love as he asks for life. I think in many ways the psalmist, without even knowing it fully, is pleading for the salvation that we know exists because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. John 10.10 says, Jesus says, The thief comes to steal and destroy, but I have come to give life and to give it abundantly. Psalm 16, the psalmist says, In your presence is the fullness of joy. And so this close, sweet communion with the Lord, this life abundance is possible, not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done for me. Now, as I was thinking just about this idea of closeness with God and and communion with God, it reminded me actually of one of my kids' favorite storybooks that we read before bedtime. This book is is called The Garden, the Temple, and the Cross. And it it kind of gives a short storyline of the entire Bible, and it starts out in the garden. And what was true in the Garden of Adam and Eve before they sinned is they had perfect communion with God. He could not be closer. They could not be in a better relationship. But you know the story. They ate the, they ate the fruit and they sinned against God. And so God kicked them out of the garden. They said, you can no longer live here. And he put guardian angels to keep them out of the garden and, and the, the, the little phrase that the book repeats a few times is, because of your sin, you can't come in. Because of their sin, they're now separated from God. They no longer get to enjoy that closeness and that perfection that they enjoyed before the sin entered into the picture. And then the story says a couple other things, but it gets to the temple. And it gives the illustration of the temple. And if you guys are familiar with the temple, there were different portions of the temple and they get increasingly more I guess close to God if you will so that the outskirts of the temple were kind of a a mingling place and then inside that is the place for the sacrifices and then inside that eventually we'll get to the holy of holies and that is literally where the presence of God was but what was guarding the holy of holies was a curtain And on that curtain, there were angels embroidered into it, guarding the presence of God. And once again, it says, the book says, because of your sin, you can't come in. Only the priest was able to go into the Holy of Holies once per year to make a sacrifice for the sins. Because of your sin, you can't come in. And then the book gets to the cross. And what happens at the cross? Well, the great high priest makes the final sacrifice for all sin. And what happens when Jesus dies on the cross in Matthew 27, 25, it says the veil, the curtain that was preventing sinners from entering into the presence of God is ripped in two from the top to the bottom. Because of your sin, you can't come in. But the book says, but... Jesus Christ has died for your sin, and therefore you can come in. Such a good children's book. Why? Because it's based on this book. Because of the cross, we can be close to God. And he can be with us. Our sin no longer separates us from him. By the way, that's what death means. Separation from God. That's why not accepting this gift of salvation that Christ has accomplished for us on the cross is such a tragedy because your eternal death will be eternal separation from this God who loves you so. The illustration doesn't end there because one day God will restore the heavens and the earth. 
He will create a new heaven and a new earth. I don't know if you knew this, but we actually are not going to be living in heaven. There will be a new earth where God will be reigning. And in Revelation verse 21, it says this. In many ways, this is a new garden, if you will. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. We will once again live in perfect closeness to the Lord. Closeness is where we find abundant life. And so it's because of the cross, it's because of our gracious King that we want to know Him more. We see all that He accomplished on our behalf. We behold His glory. We stand in awe of His holiness. We're humbled by His love. Therefore, my heart says, I want to be close to Him. Do you see the difference there between a an almost, um, oh, what's the word? A, Let me just make you feel terrible because you're not reading your Bible every day. You need to be convicted because you need to read your Bible every day. That's not the point. The point is, look at God. Do you want to be close to Him? My Bible reading and prayer is not my way of manipulating God closer to me. It's my recognition that He has already come close and that I want to stay close to Him. Because of that, I'll talk to Him. Because of that, I will listen to him. Because of that, I will submit to him. So I ask you this morning, how close are you to God? He never moves. Not only does he never move, but as we see in Jesus Christ, he is pursuing after you and would love nothing more than to be able to welcome you back into his loving arms. There's no sin that can get you out of the reach of the love of Christ, except for ultimate rejection of him. There's nothing you have done that's brought you too far. He is waiting for you. Come to him today. Live closely with him this week. Talk to him, listen to him, trust him, and love him above all else. Because your best life will be one of close communion with God. Let's pray. Our God and Father, you are so good to us. You are worthy of all of our praise. You have blessed us beyond even what we are able to fully comprehend. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, I pray this morning, I pray this week, that we would rightly see you for who you are. And therefore also rightly rightly respond to such a wonderful God that we might pursue you first that we might eagerly talk to you, that we might pray without ceasing, that we might open the lines of communication and pour out our hearts and cry out to you. Lord, help us not only to cry out to you and to talk to you, but also to listen, to quiet our hearts, to quiet our minds, to open your word and to hear straight from you. Help us to then also obey your word, to listen to it and submit to you knowing that our best life, our abundant life, regardless of circumstances or feelings, will come when we are close in communion with you. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.